I'm going to give a presentation today about uh, empowering YouTube in your classroom. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with a bunch of slides. Uh, I hate sitting through sessions where you have a bunch of stats and slides. Everyone knows what video is. Uh, everyone knows what YouTube is, and a uh, very good chance you guys are already using video. So this is just a quick intro before we get into the product uh, that we've developed. But what we've done is we've bridged YouTube, Google Apps for Education, and Vimeo together to provide a really unique video solution that lives with inside Canvas. Uh, it is an LTI app. It's very simple to configure, obviously. Um, if you're already using Google Apps for Education within your school, it seems it will feel very, very seamless uh, on setup. So I created this slide today because I keep getting asked this question quite a bit, is exactly where do we fit in the realm of video solutions for uh, Canvas? So there's really two worlds. You have the OVPs, which basically means YouTube, Vimeo, open video platforms. Um, they're great, everyone knows about them, uh, free, simple. Um, then you got the enterprise world, uh, which is usually pretty complex, uh, takes a pretty large staff to maintain and roll out. Uh, at times it could be very costly as well. So when we got into the lecture capture space about six years ago, we just noticed that there was not a really a good middleware solution to where you could still leverage YouTube, you could still leverage Vimeo Pro and some of these great open services. Um, but yet bring some enterprise type functionality into it and create a really unique environment. So that's what I'm gonna be showing you guys here. So let me, so let me start off uh, real quickly to talk a little bit about what the product is. Um, when you enable this through LTI, you basically are able to build a custom uh, YouTube portal for your course. Think of this as a centralized, well-organized, private YouTube for you. The only videos that are seen in here are only your videos, no one else's. Uh, first thing you'll notice is it's stripped down. This doesn't look like the regular YouTube site in the sense of advertisements, related links, just really clutter uh, to distract the student. So what we've done is created an experiment, uh, experience where we take all of your YouTube and bring it into this unique uh, environment which brings your own custom portal. So as we see on the course navigation, I have it labeled learning engine, it could be labeled my videos. So as students come into it, they click that tab, the very first thing they're gonna be presented is with, is with your gallery. So these are videos that we've recorded, uploaded, um, but let's talk a little bit about uh, the organization of everything here. So all of these videos are in here, it's kind of an infinite video library. There is a smart search, uh, kind of like how YouTube works in general, to start to filter down to the video that's most important to the student. So you have uh, really great search tools over your entire library. Uh, you have the capability of also creating what we call collections, which are folders. So if your students are having trouble finding the video through a search term, uh, you could group related videos together in uh, uh, folders, which we call collections. Uh, so creating things such as study guides or TEDx videos, things that are kind of outside of the regular teaching, uh, or even within the teaching, they could be concepts, you could relate those videos together. So the very first thing that the uh, uh, teacher will be presented will be a Google single sign-on the very first time they access this. Once they go through the Google single sign-on, very simple, their course is constructed, but there's no videos in it. So the very first question we get asked is usually, well, how do I get videos into the system? So I'm gonna walk over a couple of uh, cases to make that happen. Uh, just like every video management system, we do have an upload. So if you have an existing file on your computer that you did from another recording or a previous year, and you just want to get the video into the system, we have an upload uh, tool to make that happen. Uh, you also have the ability to curate content from YouTube. So any open content um, that is out there, let me select an account. So what I did is Google single sign on and it authenticated against my YouTube. And it's going through and looking at all the liked videos that I have in there. So if you go out to YouTube and you like a couple of maybe con videos, some great instructional videos that you want to share with your students, uh, just like them on YouTube. And when you're in the uh, Learning Engine uh, video portal, uh, those will be available for a seamless import. So it's very simple just to uh, select that video and now it becomes a video now within your platform. Same thing with, with Vimeo Pro. Uh, you could connect into Vimeo through a, a single sign-on type process and import Vimeo videos directly as well. So those are the real basic ways to get content into it. Um, we do have a software uh, personal recording app. 
And this app is free. It's on the Google Chrome store. I'll be happy to give that link out at the end of the uh, uh, session. But basically, it's a screen recording app that records your screen, webcam, audio. And it's a quick recording app. So let me jump through this real quick so you get a feel for it. So I'm going to record my entire screen. And as you see, it's a very simple app. Uh, we didn't want to add a lot of complexity. Video is a very complex environment to develop in, so we could make the interface very confusing. And we have actually stripped it down to where it's just basically select what you want to record from, hit start, you could pause it, hit stop. And then at the end of this, all of your managed media is here in a library for you to seamlessly upload uh, to say to YouTube. Uh, what do you mean by that? I'm sorry. So if I want to get my videos in there and I'm using Chrome already, mm -hmm. is there already a, a pre-designed default that's there? As soon as I click, it's there. Or do I have to create it? No, yeah. basically, the way the app works is it just presents you your devices that you have, and then you just select. Um, you could do an audio only, you could do a webcam only, or you could do a screen with a webcam in it to make more of a rich presentation. Uh, but yeah, once you select your devices, uh, they give you a few little controls for resolution and where you want the placement of the image, but uh, it's a real-time recording, so once you hit start, it starts recording. Once you hit stop, it stops, and we have a seamless uh, upload directly into YouTube. You could also browse for files locally here through, uh, as well as our website, to get files into it. Uh, this platform actually works with, um, or this app itself works with uh, YouTube and Vimeo, so once you authenticate the account with your Vimeo Pro account or your YouTube account, uh, that's how you get the start, stop, upload uh, without really uh, much interaction between there. Uh, so that is one way to get content into our platform. It's a, it's, it is a Google Chrome extension, so it works across all operating systems, including Chromebooks. Uh, does not work on iOS, obviously. Um, it lives within the Chrome browser. So if they're using Chrome to access Canvas, it's just, again, native to the whole environment. They're not going outside, looking for desktop software, installing it. Uh, the app also auto-updates, so you don't have to worry about um, uh, faculty and, and IT, and more importantly, updating the software every few months for bugs, fixes, updates. Uh, with the Chrome uh, piece, we actually push all the updates live. So it's a really great app for, for recording. And again, it is free. Uh, you don't have to use it with the learning engine. You could actually record and save files locally. Uh, but we do have those hooks into YouTube and Vimeo Pro. Um, so those are ways that we could capture content and get it into it. I will not dive into my hardware. Uh, we also have a hardware-based appliance. It's really for mission-critical room recording. So. In universities where you might want to record every day, eight hours a day, there could be absolutely no failures, has to be HD, teacher does not want to interact with it, you have to have hardware. There's, there's no software that's going to answer all of those questions. So we do have a very nice open hardware appliance because we have an open philosophy in development. Um, but that could act as a dedicated room recorder. Um, and all of those videos could automatically sync into your course as well. Um, and I'll show you the end result of uh, one of those I think I have. This is the only video I have in here for sample, but what we're looking at is just a hardware recording, just so you see the differences in them. Uh, this is just a four source recording, and the way it works, and let me, hopefully the internet will be nice. Let me jump out here. Perfect, so let me buffer it out a little bit. So the way it works is you record all the different perspectives in the room. Uh, each of them are concurrently recorded and basically all of the videos are synchronized together and put in this playback experience. And the way it works is all of the sources that are being recorded could be switched in real time. So the video, unfortunately, is not fast enough right now, but uh, uh, if I'm at 18 minutes into the video and I actually want to look at the document camera and not, say, the talking head or the computer screen, I could actually switch to that perspective and watch that in full HD. Uh, so that's the only really difference between the rest of our capturing uh, products and our actual hardware itself. Uh, it gives you a multi-perspective. Now, the great thing about this uh, technology is, you know, a student watching a video, student A could actually be more interested in the document camera. Student B could be looking at it and be more interested in the PowerPoint. So you're letting the user switch to the content that's most important to them, which uh, is really great for students. How is this for mobile? Uh, as far as the experience, it's complete HTML. Yeah, I'm sorry? If you go back to that player that you had. I noticed you had some buttons at the bottom. I'm curious how that would work for mobile. It's all HTML5. So if I'm watching a video, 
you would see those tabs under it. Yeah, I, iPad, it's iOS, you know, good old Apple uh, being proprietary. It's, there's not a way around it. So it'd stop it, switch it. it would stop and switch. If, if you're using Android or any other type of tablet device that's not iOS, you actually get the same exact experience that you would see on here. No, good question. So, you know, I demonstrated the, the, the portal itself. Um, I'm going to get into some of the video uh, because this is actually a very important piece in it. So earlier, I started, started to type a keyword because as a student, I knew there was a video that talked about the speed of light. I don't know which video it is. There's four or 500 in here. So I start to search and I drill down to it. Now, the very first thing that you notice is I type the word speed. That's not in the title. It's not in the description. There's not even tags for it. How did it find it? So we work with data from a couple of certain perspectives. We call it video data, the title, description, tags. That allows you to point to find the actual video itself. But we actually have a mechanism to index the entire timeline. So any second of the video, you could actually add text to it for search and discovery. So what happened was actually on that global library search, I typed the word speed. It found the video, but it actually knows the word speed was mentioned in here. Um, so as I start to uh, type this out, you could start to see different uh, keywords pop up. Nope, that's not what I'm looking for. Let me keep typing. Oh yeah, speed of light, three minutes and 27 seconds. So the idea is to really drive the, the student down to the point in time. If you look at any video, it doesn't matter who's hosting it, uh, they only watch about 10% of the video. It, it, it's true, they go in and they're, doing, they're using the most popular button on YouTube that no one talks about, it's called the scrub bar. Uh, they scrub to find what they want. If they're smart and kind of understand the content, then they could probably find it. If not, they move around for a few minutes and just say, I found it or I didn't, moved on. So this gives every student the capability to find different pieces of content within your video. So I don't have a lot of content in here. I just created this as an example, but obviously I could add pretty much any piece of information to any second within the video. So I actually wrote a, a note for students as well. Uh, just talking about the speed of light and a particular moment within this at two minutes and 55 seconds that I want them to watch. So what we're looking at right now is just timeline based data that's associated to the video that allows uh, the students to do a deep dive uh, into the uh, video. So we have a little tool called the notepad and basically this is all the teacher notes that are on here so I could view if you have long form notes and you have a ton of notes that you want to go through you could actually add those in here. It uh, doesn't matter, they could be short references, you could add links in here. Uh, the point is, is it's content that's associated to the video in real time that's playing back. So as the video is going on, this notepad rolls and it shows the, the notes for that and obviously they could click on any of those to jump to the point in time. Uh, you could also chunk your content up, we saw that as pretty important as well. Uh, especially if you're creating video that's anywhere from 20 minutes to say an hour. Uh, chunking up your video into concepts, uh, chapters, uh, whatever makes sense best to your students is a great way to kind of divide your content up. And again, once they're in the video, it's all about the student. My learning gap is different than the next student's learning gap. Take me to what I need help with. And so the more you make your videos smarter, the better results you get at the end and the students will interact. We actually hope to see those stats uh, of, of retention at 10% actually go down. Uh, we hope that it's two minutes, because that means they're going in and finding what they want. They do the same thing on Wikipedia. They find the article, scan it, here's my paragraph, this is what I want, um, and then they leave. So the same concept now with video. They could come in, find what they want. More importantly, as they're having problems with multiple subjects, they could keep typing in here and finding different concepts, and yeah, I need to go to eight minutes, now I need to go to 13 minutes. Um, so it gives a, a different dynamic environment for, for viewing video. Transcripts, uh, we do, and I'll talk a little bit about transcripts. Uh, we do automatic uh, uh, search and tr uh, captionings through YouTube. Uh, YouTube is okay at doing that. It depends on the content, your dialect, and a lot of other things. Uh, but we do have an automatic way to hook into that. And within this system, you could link to the captions editor and m manually do all of that. Um, if you don't have time and you want this fully automated, uh, we work with transcription companies. The one I'm gonna mention is 3Play. They're the actual transcription company for YouTube. So if you look at any TEDx video that's professionally transcribed, chances are 3 Play did it in the back end. So we actually have a, a process with 3 Play in here to where a teacher could come in here, and I'll show that to you, and actually process any video for professional transcription. 
actually I'll scan down this page real quick. This is our uh, uh, editor to add text or, or data to the timeline. Super simple. We wanted to make this just brain dead easy to where it's like, I look at a video, I know the time, add. So really, really simple for you to go in here and add any point in time. Uh, these are chapters. Of course, notes are, are more long form. Uh, so very, very easy to do. Uh, direct YouTube controls. So if this is your video and you wanted to say, you know what, I want to actually enhance it, annotate it, edit the captions, it takes you to that, that uh, uh, video within the YouTube uh, section. And 3Play. So this is a very big topic is captionings, you know, meeting uh, Section 508 compliancy. Um, there's really only two ways to do this. Either you do it manually and YouTube offers the tools to do it, extremely time consuming, or you pay someone to do it. And on average, depending on how much video you're doing, it's gonna run anywhere from maybe a dollar a minute to three dollars a minute for video. So as you can imagine campus-wide, this becomes extremely costly. But we have both options. You know, you could upload your video to YouTube, let it automatically transcribe it. We have the tool to hook into it, update it. Once it's updated, then our system picks it up as, as the proper captions as well as search as well. So very, very uh, uh, simple tools to kind of make all of that happen. Absolutely. Uh, to be honest, if you already have a transcribed video on YouTube that you paid for, we'll pick up those SRT files and automatically include that into our, our mix. Um, so yeah, if you already have, you could use pretty much any captioning platform. There's tons out there that are just software driven that you could install. They all output a file and you could append it to this process and now that video takes advantage of it. <clears throat> Absolutely, because what's going to happen is the, the teacher is going to use their own Google account, right? It's under their account, and they own that video, so they're going to have direct access to that captioning. The great thing is they could actually open up shared access to that, so if there's students that want to help with that or a TA or something like that, uh, YouTube allows multiple people to come in and kind of joint edit. Uh, but yeah, it's basically the rule is if you own the video, you could edit the captions that YouTube automatically uh, generates for you. Um, I'm going to jump into one more thing here. Let me. So we, we, it is an LTI app at the end of the day. Uh, so obviously you saw the course gallery integration. Uh, we have another integration that allows you to embed video into any piece of content within Canvas. So if you're creating group content, course content, um, you could you know, come in here, typical WYSIWYG editor that, that you're comfortable with. And there's a little button here. And once you click that, the video gallery now pops up. It's the same exact course gallery that I just showed you. The only difference now is you could come through here and say, yes, I want to embed that Einstein video. And so now that will be a reference link directly within uh, that course content. So just another way to, to use it. Uh, in all honesty, we support every LTI extension. Uh, so navigation, modules, and all the others. Uh, just this tool and the course assignment is the most popular ones. And then they have functionality <laughs> Yes, actually the same experience that I showed you with the search, they get that full experience still. So all the rich interaction stuff is still uh, persistent even though you embed it. Could they go outside of that video to another video from there? No, this is more about selecting a video asset. You could add multiple videos in here, so watch video one, watch video two. Uh, we don't really have the tools yet to kind of like do that, that linking type uh, capability in there. Uh, but just a really quick, simple way to get uh, a video into uh, any type of content that you're creating within Canvas. Actually, great question. Uh, we strip all of that clutter out. There's no advertisements. At the end of the video, you're not going to get a related video. It is a truly clean experience. The students cannot get distracted. Uh, so all of, all of that is completely stripped out. To be honest, that's our number one feature because that you don't get that today. So the fact that you could organize it, control it, group it, and the fact is when they go to your course and look at your videos, if there's a video in there you don't want them to see, that's because you put it in there. So um, you have great, great, great control over it. Um, and the indexing really gives you a lot of flexibility on search. Like I showed you, the in, in, inline search is great, but what happens if you build your course library over the next few years and you have 100, 200, 300 videos in there um, that you want to keep repurposing, um, you're going to want to be able to, uh, to make that happen. You could also push these videos to different courses. Uh, if you wanted to share a particular video you created, but there's another course that you want to dump it into, you could actually share this, this 
course or this video that you've created in the learning engine and share it with a complete different course as well. So you can move video around courses if needed as well. All of the analytics behind this is Google Analytics. So we tell you to put your Google Analytics key in here. So all the tracking is the typical YouTube uh, analytic tracking. Um, the most important, I would say, metric that's in there would be audience retention. You're going to want to know where they're dropping off. And 20 minute video, no one has looked at the last eight minutes. That tells you a lot, so you could recreate the video. Uh, so I definitely would use that as your best metric within YouTube, but it's going to give you all your basic statistics of you know, how many, what devices are coming in and, and all the basic stuff with it. Question over here. Yeah. Just so I'm clear on what you've been saying, because you're, you're using a lot of text speak. Mm -hmm. So for those of us who create, once we create our Google or YouTube accounts and upload our uh, videos to that, Canvas will strip everything out that has nothing to do with what we're teaching. Yes, our platform strips all of that out. And so the final result is kind of a clean experience within Canvas. Because it's really our app. It's our service. And so everything that's coming in, we clean. We do a lot of work to kind of present this out. So yeah, if it's, if it's within here, it's, it's controlled that way. One more follow-up. Sure. The analytics aspect, because I have not used that before, so is that handled at the individual user's uh, site, or is that where our administrator handles that? <sighs> It really depends on how you set that up. You can share access in analytics to te with teachers, kind of sandboxed. It's a lot of work on the admin, so chances are you would probably request it from the admin, but if they have the time, they could, they could make that happen. Okay, because that to me seems very time consuming, so I'm, okay, great, they can handle that. Yeah. And they'll connect that to our video account, is that the idea? That's the idea. Basically, what you do is you embed we have a configuration screen, and you embed your Google Analytics key into it. So once you embed that key, everything's just we everything's tracked on the back end. Um, once once it's in Analytics, you could break up, you could create custom reports and do all kinds of great things with it to get the information out uh, that's that's most important to people. Yeah. Uh, what about the YouTube video settings, the privacy settings? Great. I was waiting for that question to come up. Um, yes, the most. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, privacy setting, one of the most common questions that we get is we need to block YouTube, general YouTube for all the students so they're not just surfing YouTube all day, but they need to see these videos. Uh, yes, there is a way to do it. Um, we actually could do some things through our app, but it's mainly a firewall routine. So you could set up a proxy to basically allow these videos that are embedded from Canvas to be the only videos viewable within the network. I have the video files themselves. Mm -hmm. You can. You can pull in private videos. That's actually, that's a really great question. It's something we don't talk about a lot, but actually we've been seeing usage behind it. When you upload a video to YouTube, it's either public, which you probably don't want, unlisted is probably what you currently use, and then private. Of course, with private, you could put who has access to it. That private video will display in here, and what will happen is if that student, say, is not logged into it, or they're, you know, we're going to recognize their Google single sign-on, either they're signed on or they're not. If they are, they'll be, and they have access to it, that video will be able to be played. Um, if not, you'll basically get a, a private video in the, in the portal. So that's kind of an interesting mix. Another que uh, workaround with that real quick is Vimeo Pro. I didn't talk much about it, but Vimeo Pro runs $200 a year. They basically give you some enterprise features that uh, YouTube cannot give you. You could lock your video down with Vimeo Pro. No one could view it. It's not in the public uh, 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 Vimeo site, and the actual embed is locked down to our system and your campus. Uh, if someone tries to siphon it, then they're going to get the, you know, this video is, uh, is private. So if privacy is a really big concern, you could mash them up. And in the screen that I'm looking at right now, as you saw, I showed you a Vimeo video, and the rest are YouTube. So you could actually intermingle private YouTube, unlisted YouTube, and Vimeo Pro videos in there as well. So if there is a video that you really want to lock down, it's for, you know, maybe it's a, it's a particular course. You just do not want these videos leaked out on, online. Put them in Vimeo Pro. Uh, for $199 a year, you get same unlimited streaming, unlimited pretty much features that um, uh, uh, YouTube provides you with the exception of uh, storage, and it's about a terabyte, which is a pretty large uh, uh, storage, but for that price, it's not too bad to secure and lock down your videos. Yes? Can you push, so we use modules a lot to break it up, is this all existing in the My Videos section, or can you drop another module of video or series of videos? Yeah, you could do it in modules as well. Uh, basically, we support every LTI extension, which obviously Canvas supports. 
Um, so getting it even into the navigation control, you could do that. Modules, we've, had, we've seen uh, people do the integration with modules. Uh, the most two common ones are the course gallery, which we're looking at now, and then at the, uh, what we call the WYSIWYG rich editor. And wherever that editor is seen within Canvas, you'll have the ability to embed that content. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. Not yet. Okay. Not yet. We will. Is the X course only something only one single the YouTube account and one video one Vimeo account? If we, there is a multiple like a core teacher core teachers in basically it's either lumped all together or individual. We recommend everyone be individual. So if your school's using Google Apps for Education, everyone every teacher already has an account. So they would be using that particular account to do the authentication. Vimeo Pro, I would recommend being more of a um, more of a school-wide type uh, access. That way everything's kind of dumped into there and then pulled in individually. Um, it's usually our two, our two recommendations. Yes? Um, no, it's not. Uh, it probably will be added soon, but you could default that on YouTube. So every video that's uploaded automatically is private. Is probably the best thing, and then you select which ones you want public or unlisted. Any other? Yep. Um, so uh, Zaption and Educanon are kind of like enrichment tools. Mm -hmm. I've played around with. Does this kind of remove those tools and you can do your own enrichment with that? Yes. You know, I you know I can't give a, a good comparison between our products and those products, but yes, basically the, at the end of the day, that's what it's about, enri enriching that video. Um, and just to let you guys know, we just launched this app about three months ago, and the team is working furiously on version two already. Um, just to give you an insight of what we're going to be doing, we're going to be mashing every single thing with Google into this platform. Uh, a lot of the work is already done. We're just trying to finalize everything. So integrating Google Forms for questions, um, I mean, it's just the list is unreal of what we're integrating, even chat widgets. Why? Because Google gives it to us. And so we're creating that into the whole learning experience and leveraging all those other interactivity things that Google provides, but they don't mash with YouTube very well. Um, so yeah, th at the end of the day, it is, this is a really nice Google Vimeo mashup uh, for, for Canvas. Um, uh, like I said, we, you know. Yeah. Basically, Google, Google Apps for Education gives you access to a tremendous amount of services, right? Uh, I'll give you an example of one. I don't like to talk too much about the features that we have coming out, but uh, student note taking. Well, how does that work? All students have Drive accounts. So we leverage different Google services to provide rich interactivity with this. Again, the student owns it, right? That's, that, if you are using Google Apps for school, why aren't, they're probably using Drive for everything else. So all the note taking that will be done from the video. So if I'm a student, I want to take a note, my note, at two minutes. It's actually going to be leveraging their Google Drive account. So just to kind of give you an idea of, of, of the integration uh, that's going on is we're really fusing together different Google services to do that. Chat in general, uh, uh, they have Google Talk, so that could be automatically embedded. Again, if you're using Google Apps for Education, everything's single signed on. So once they're signed on, just the widgets are automatically all going to pop and play. And you're using the video and I the timeline mm -hmm. to link with other content. Absolutely. Our, our biggest IP is controlling the timeline. So we have a lot of granular control over the timeline itself, and adding functionality around that is really our future and what we want to provide uh, uh, to students to give them more, more interactivity. But for now, you know, we looked at this first version as enriching. It's all about enriching your media so your students could search, discover, and interact with your video better than they can today. The next stage is student interaction and building more tools for them to collaborate and, and engage around a moment in the video or the entire video is, is what we're doing. Yep, um, might be last question, I don't know. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you kind of tossed off that iOS comment in the beginning. If we're a large Mac school, does mm -hmm. that mean that most of these tools would work for us? No, the tool absolutely works for Mac. The capture app doesn't. So only our capturing technology doesn't work for it. That currently is with Chrome. So. Yeah. So we can set it up as a teacher with our Google and our students, even though they don't have Google Slide access to all the videos. Yeah, you could set this up individually per course or per campus if you wanted to. And they could use their personal Google account if they're not using Google Apps for Education, or they use their school's account. Cool. 
All right. Well, thank you, everybody. We do have a, a booth out by the uh, showcase. <laughs>